In this video, we'll introduce scale-free networks. In previous video, we introduced the graph theory, random networks, and small world networks. You can find the video links in the description section below. Previously, we talked about Duncan Watts and Stephen Strogatz's paper on the small world networks published in 1998 in Nature. After reading the paper, Albert Lasso Barabashi, who was a physicist at the University of Notre Dame, sent an email to Watts. In his email, Barabashi requested the data sets used in Watts' paper. Watts generously shared the data set. A year later, Barabashi published the paper in Science to report something important that Duncan Watts had missed. What Duncan Watts had missed was to check the degree distribution of the small world networks. Many distributions in the real world follow the normal distribution, which has a shape often known as a bell curve. The heights of adult humans follow the normal distribution. Test scores usually follow the normal distribution. Many statistical tests assume the variables follow the normal distribution. If we apply the theory of random networks in which nodes are connected randomly, the degree distribution of the random networks should follow something similar to the normal distribution. In fact, it follows the Poisson distribution. The Poisson distribution is not quite the same as the normal distribution, but very similar. In small world networks, if you plot the distribution of degrees of all nodes, you don't see the normal distribution. Instead, you see a power law distribution. It starts with the maximum value followed with a rapid decline with a long tail. The plot of degree distribution is highly right skewed, meaning that a few nodes have very high value, but most of the nodes have a small value that's producing a long tail to the right of the degree distribution. How to differentiate a power law distribution from a normal distribution? You focus on two things. First, a normal distribution has a peak at its average value, but a power law distribution starts with its maximum value and then decreases dramatically. Second, the rate at which the power law decays is much slower than the decay rate for a normal distribution. This is why you see a long tail in the power law distribution. This suggests extreme events are more likely to take place in power law distribution than a normal distribution. In the power law distribution, there is no peak and the long tail stretches on and on, so there is no scale. We call it scale-free. In scale-free networks, there are a small number of nodes that function as hubs. Network hubs are defined as the nodes with the largest number of ties. They are highly connected in the networks. A power law distribution is a widespread distribution in the real world. City populations follow a power law distribution. Very few cities have a very large population, such as New York City, Los Angeles, Chicago, Houston, and Phoenix. But most of the cities have a much smaller population. The magnitude and the frequencies of earthquakes follow power law distributions. The sales of books and music recordings follow a power law distribution. The diameter of craters on the moon follows a power law distribution. The frequency of occurrence of people's first names in most cultures follow a power law distribution. The frequency of use of words in any human language follows a power law distribution. 
In fact, 75% of words in scientific papers are redundant to get to the concepts. So this is the scientific evidence for you to take advantage of this scale-free network as you read scientific papers. Our email networks are scale-free networks. The World Airline Network is a scale-free network as well. The distribution of wealth in the United States also follow the power law distribution. A very small number of Americans are super rich. As of January 2021, the richest American was Elon Musk. His net worth was about $188 billion. The second richest American was Jeff Bezos with about $187 billion followed by Bill Gates with $129 billion and Mark Zuckerberg with over $100 billion. But most Americans are on the long tail of the power law distribution. The number of papers scientists write follows a power law distribution as well. There is enormous inequality in scientific productivity only about 6% of scientists produce half of the all papers published. The distribution of scientific publications shows more inequality than the distribution of personal income. The citations of scientific papers are even more unequally distributed than the counts of scientific publications. Of all papers in the Science and Citation Index, only 1% have 100 citations and more. About 47% of the papers have never been cited at all. A power law distribution can describe the 80-20 rule. For example, 80% of decisions are made during 20% of the meeting time. And a large number of meetings don't have high productivity. About 80% of hyperlinks on web pages point to about 20% of web pages that are the hubs on the internet. About 80% of crime is committed by 20% of criminals. In random networks, most of the nodes have the same number of ties. So the random networks have a scale in its node connectivity. If you look at the US roadmap, you see each major city has at least one road to the highway system, but you don't see a city with hundreds of highways. There is a different pattern if you look at the airline routing map of the United States. Because you see hubs like Chicago, New York, Atlanta, Denver, and Dallas. Those hubs then connect to other small airports. A majority airports are small ones, and they are on the long tail of a power law distribution. One property of scale-free networks is the Matthew effect. The name of the Matthew effect comes from a Bible verse in the book of Matthew. For whoever has will be given more, and they'll have an abundance. Whoever does not have, even what they have will be taken from them. The Matthew effect is also called the rich get richer effect. The network hubs are those who are highly connected in the networks. The advantage of being hubs gives the highly connected nodes more advantage to attract new nodes who join the networks. Privileged people tend to preserve their privileges and advantages to get ahead in society. The Matthew effect is a property of scale-free networks. If you are a new researcher in your field and you have an opportunity to co-author with a scientist, do you prefer to co-author with a well-established scientist whose work has been frequently cited? Or do you prefer to co-author with an unknown author in your field? 
Most people prefer the former. Your preferential attachment to the hubs, the well-established and highly recognized scientist in co-authorship network, give the hubs more advantage in growing their co-authorship network and locking the advantage of being a hub in the network. In the previous video on random networks, I mentioned that. Paul Erdős published about 1,500 mathematical papers. If you build a co-authorship network for mathematicians, Erdős had over 500 co-authors. He was one of the largest hubs. If the growth of a network follows preferential attachment, the network will eventually grow into a scale-free network, exhibiting the Matthew effect. There are two conditions laid out by Barabashi for generating scale-free networks: growth and preferential attachment. Small advantages are magnified to a critical mass. This is the network I created in August 2020. Back then, whether to open schools for face-to-face -face instruction was hotly debated. I used the hashtag #SchoolReopening to collect the data on who mentioned whom or replied to whom in over 18,000 tweets on Twitter. I highlighted the hubs in the networks. There was Trump, who was the president. There was Joe Biden, who was running for the president. There was the Secretary of Education and the CDC. On Twitter, almost anyone can post a tweet. But does your tweet get people's attention? In fact, most tweets get very little attention, and only a few tweets go viral. Your tweets make very little influence, unless. You become the hub on social media. Are scale-free networks robust to attacks? It depends. If we randomly remove a node from the network, since most of the nodes are not hubs, the node removal does not have much influence on the network. Hundreds of routers routinely malfunction on the internet at any given moment, but we rarely notice the disruption. However, if the hubs are under attack, removing hubs would have a widespread impact on the entire network. The same applies to proteins in our body. Most proteins interact with one or two other proteins, so it is difficult to disrupt a cell's protein interaction network. Proteins will continue to work together even after a high level of random mutations. In general, scale-free networks are incredibly robust against accidental failures. Randomly removing some nodes from the network would not make a lot of influence on the network because of the nodes in the scale-free networks are not hubs. In scale-free networks, the existence of hubs makes the rich get richer and winners take all. However, if we remove hubs, the networks will immediately fall apart. Those hubs are the Achilles heel of the scale-free networks. In fact, if you want to dismantle a scale-free network, you don't need to attack all hubs. You only need to simultaneously remove as few as five percent to fifteen percent of all hubs, and the network falls apart. Those hubs are too big to fail. What you see on the screen is an airline network. The nodes indicate airports. The hub airports are the big nodes. In one of the hubs, the Hartsfield-Jackson International Airport in Atlanta had a massive 11-hour power outage in 2018. What were the consequences? The power outage did not just paralyze the airport; it created a ripple effect across the country and the world. During the 2008 financial meltdown, the "too big to fail" argument was used to justify bailing out the big banks who created the crisis in the first place. 
after the financial crisis, the bank get bigger. The top ten financial institutions hold seventy seven percent of all U. S. banking assets. What if we apply the "too big to fail" argument to all industries, organizations, and political parties? What's going to happen to an organization as a whole if one individual has an absolute control? What's going to happen to a society as a whole if one organization or one political party gets too powerful? Recall random networks. In the previous video on random networks, we mentioned that if we keep adding ties to connect nodes randomly, a giant component will eventually emerge in the networks. This giant component includes a large proportion of all nodes. The same phenomenon has different names in different disciplines. Mathematicians call it the emergence of a giant component. Physicists call it percolation. It is a phase transition that is similar to the moment in which water freezes. There is a rapid change in the phase transition because it transitions from a disconnected phase to a connected one. The point at which the phase transition starts to happen is called the critical point. Sociologists call the same phenomenon the formation of a community. What does this phenomenon have to do with power loss? It turns out, when a system undergoes a phase transition, power loss emerge. Power loss bring chaos into order. Near the critical point, just when order emerges from disorder, all units in the system follow power loss. For example, at zero degrees Celsius, the water molecules suddenly form a perfectly ordered ice crystal. The water molecules come together by following power laws. Before water freezes, liquid water is disorganized and it follows in a disordered manner. After water freezes, ice is ordered with high symmetry. Power laws are the signature of self-organizing systems, such as water going from liquid to gas, a metal becoming a magnet, a ceramic turning into a superconductor, and activities in neurons turning into thoughts and consciousness. If you see a self-organizing system, you know a power law exists and reigns. Hubs are the consequences of power loss. In self-organizing, scale-free networks, power loss are the norm, not the exception. They are ubiquitous in real networks. The presence of scale-free networks is the evidence of the self-organizing process, but it does not mean that the network is at the edge of randomness and chaos. In scale-free networks, the most connected nodes are the ones who join the networks very early on. They have the first mover advantage, and they move fast and break the status quo. Here comes another question: If hubs get new nodes preferential attachment and the rich get richer, does that mean newcomers will stay on the long tail forever? Without a chance to become hubs, from your life experience, you may have already seen the new kid on the block who shows up very late, but the kid is very smart, innovative, and gregarious. Over time, the kid emerges as the head of the pack. Barabashi argued that preferential attachment is dependent on the node's fitness. It is the node's ability to attract ties from new nodes. In your social networks, it is your ability to make new friends and to be liked by your friends. Your fitness in a social network can come from your gregarious personalities or your talent. In a competitive environment, each node has a fitness. A higher fitness means a node attracts more ties in the network. Node fitness makes or breaks the hubs. 
if you are the early birds in the network, you have a first mover advantage. But this advantage does not guarantee that you will remain as a hub if you are not a good fit in the network. An example is that the dominance of the social networking site MySpace was challenged by the newcomer Facebook. A more recent example is the increasing popularity of Tesla electric cars. In organizations, if a leader, such as a president or a superintendent, governs the organization by barking orders without respect, coercing and threatening people, playing favoritism, and pitting people against one another, not many employees would want to have preferential attachment to the leader. The leader is toxic in the organization, and he or she would not become the hub of the social network in the organization. The leader may still be at the top of the chain of command because of the power comes with the position, but the leader is not the hub of the social network because the leader is not a fit in the organizational network. Fitness over hard power. In some networks, the fittest node becomes the winner who takes all by attracting all new ties. Google search engine was a late cover, but it has become so popular that it is now the dominant search engine, functioning as the hub of the internet. What are the implications of scale-free networks? Why do we need to study scale-free networks? One important implication is that if we can determine whether a network is scale-free or not, we have a better understanding of the behavior of the network system. Researchers first consider the internet as a random network as they studied how new routing protocol could affect system congestion. But later, researchers noticed that the internet was a scale-free network with only a few hubs. With this knowledge, researchers had to update their computer models used to simulate the internet. Another example is the spread of disease and ideas. Diffusion theories predict a critical threshold for the propagation of a contagion. Below the infection threshold, virus and ideas will eventually die out. Above the threshold, virus or ideas will multiply exponentially, eventually penetrating the entire system. Those are the predictions based on the diffusion theories. But in scale-free networks, the threshold is zero. Disease or ideas will eventually penetrate the entire system, even when they are weakly contagious. Why? Because the hubs in the scale-free networks are connected to so many other nodes. The chance of a node to be infected through at least one of its connected nodes can be fairly high. Once a hub is infected, the hub will pass the virus or ideas to other nodes, eventually infecting other hubs, which will then penetrate the entire system. If you want to stop the spread of virus or ideas according to the property of scale-free networks, is it enough to immunize only hubs? Focusing on the hubs in scale-free networks is obviously more effective than randomly selected nodes, but it is not sufficient to stop the spread of virus or ideas. It is not enough to focus on the existence or absence of ties in the networks. We also need to take into consideration the frequency and the duration of ties that connect the nodes. In this video, we discussed scale-free networks Next week, we'll introduce the strength of weak tie theory.